Sure. Yeah, I'm probably going to have to boost it up. All right. Okay. Is it possible? There we go. I was just going to ask. Is it possible to turn off some of the lights here in front? Okay. Um, if you can't see the screen because it's kind of small and you need to move towards the front, feel free to do that, all right? Uh, although I will tell you what's up here. So hopefully you're going to be able to read some of this at least, all right? Okay, so the title of the talk that I've, I'm giving tonight is Christ Giving Christ to Christ, Liturgical Spirituality for Liturgical Ministers. Um, where does this phrase come from, Christ giving Christ to Christ? It comes from my own reflection upon the writings of the early church fathers, particularly the writings of St. Augustine. This is something that I say to the people who are attending the diocesan formation sessions to become extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. Since becoming a bishop, I haven't been able to do as many of those as I used to in the past, but it is one of the things that I would mention to those who are preparing to become extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion that this is a foundational concept of the Catholic faith, and it's what I want to kind of unpack this evening. Before I do that, though, just to say a word about liturgical spirituality. When I talk about liturgical spirituality this evening, I'm not talking about what we do at the liturgy. And I'm not even primarily talking about how we pray at the liturgy. When I talk about liturgical spirituality, I'm talking about a way of life. Spirituality is not just about how we pray, it's about how we live. And a liturgical spirituality is about living from the liturgy of the church. It's about living from our celebration of the Eucharist. And so I want you to keep that in mind as I share with you some reflections this evening that really I'm talking about a way of life that we are invited to live certainly as members of the faith community, but even in a more particular way because we have been invited and called to be ministers of the church at the liturgy. And so this makes a big difference. So this does come from the writings of St. Augustine, who died in the year 430. Fifth century bishop, bishop of Hippo in North Africa, uh, early church father, great saint, great teacher of prayer, very much involved in the liturgy of the church and the development of the church's sacramental life. It was Augustine's habit in the week after the Easter vigil, so during the first week of the Easter season, to gather all of the neophytes, the newly initiated, into the church community, to gather them and to do mystagogy, to reflect upon what it is that they experienced at the Easter Vigil. And so he would share with them at the celebration of the Eucharist on the days after Easter homilies in which he would unpack what they experienced at the Vigil. And in, in two of his most famous homilies as he's reflecting upon the Eucharist, he said in Sermon 57, Behold what you are, become what you receive. And in this, he was referring to the invitation to Holy Communion. When the priest holds up the host and says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. St. Augustine is saying you are not just beholding the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, you are not just beholding the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. You are beholding yourself because you are a member of his body. You are the body of Christ as the church community. And so Augustine would say to the neophytes, when you come to Mass, behold who you are 
and become what you receive. Become Eucharist. Become Christ. Become the presence of God to those around you. In Sermon 272, he would tell the neophytes, when you come up to receive communion and the minister of the church says to you, the body of Christ, and you say amen, your amen is not just an affirmation of your, of your belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Your amen is not just and only saying, yes, I believe that this is Christ. Your amen is also an amen to who you are as a member of Christ's body. And Augustine would tell the neophytes, your amen is only going to be true, it's only going to be authentic if you live as a member of Christ's body. It's only true, it's only authentic if you live as a member of Christ's body. So in fact, we have become and are becoming Christ by grace. We are not just called to receive Christ in the Eucharist, we are called to become Christ to one another, to be God's chosen people, to be God's anointed ones, to be God's instruments in the midst of the world today. We are to be the bearers of God's presence, so we have become and are becoming Christ by grace, which means that we are called not just to celebrate the liturgy and the sacraments, we are called to become liturgy. We are called to become the sacrament of God's presence. Now this can sound like a pretty radical statement, one that's almost unbelievable, and yet it's true. What Christ is by nature, fully human and fully divine, we are called to become by grace. He became human, the early church fathers said, so that we could become divine, so that we can share in God's own life. What Christ is by nature, we are becoming by grace. This is the teaching of the church. And how is it possible for us to become Christ by grace? It's only impossible through the activity of God's love transforming our lives. We do not become this on our own. We do not save ourselves. We cannot make ourselves holy. It is only by God's grace that we can grow in the divine life. And God makes this possible through our sacraments because in our sacraments, we are encountering the presence of the living God. This is why the church teaches that the intent of every church liturgy is twofold. Whether we're coming together to celebrate the liturgy, the hours, evening prayers we did tonight, or to celebrate the Eucharist, or to celebrate any of the sacraments, to bury the dead, to visit the sick, anything that is a liturgy of the church has as its purpose two intentions to give glory, thanks, and praise to God for what God has done for us and to sanctify us, to make us holy. This is the purpose of every liturgy, for us to give thanks to God for what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, to give thanks to God for Christ's saving activity, to give thanks to God for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit into our lives. And as we give thanks to God, God is sanctifying us, making us holy. So in our sacramental liturgical rituals, the church says, Christ is always acting first. You know, we come to Mass on Sunday, and we think, well, we're doing the liturgy. We're the ones who are celebrating. We sing, we pray, we stand, we sit, we kneel, we process, we listen, we respond, we sing. And it's very easy for us to think, well, this is all about us. This is us acting. This is us doing. 
And it's so easy for us to forget that we are only able to do what we are doing because Christ is the one who has called us here in the first place. And it is Christ who is acting in the midst of the community. It is Jesus revealing himself to us in the celebration of the, of the Eucharist and enabling us to give God thanks and praise and enabling us to be sanctified by the action of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So it is always Christ who is acting first and our activity follows in response. I would bet that you are a liturgical minister in your own community either because something inside of you led you to believe that you could do this ministry. Well, I could be a lector. I could be an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion. I could sing in the choir. Or maybe someone in the community said to you, have you ever thought about doing this? Either way, that's the grace of God at work in your life. Christ inspiring you to be a minister, or Christ calling you through someone else to minister in the community, and you responding. To be a minister is to be somebody who has been called to the ministry. It's not something we volunteer for. We're not volunteers. We are called to the ministry. And it is Christ who calls us and we respond. And that's an encounter. When we come to the celebration of the church's liturgies, we are encountering the presence of the living God. When we gather here, especially Sunday after Sunday, day after day to celebrate the Eucharist, our encounter here is as significant as Moses' encounter with God in the burning bush. It is as significant as the Israelites' encounter with God leading them out of slavery in Egypt to the Promised Land. It is as significant as Christ during his public life calling his first disciples. What we do here is exactly as significant as what Jesus did with his disciples on the night before he died. This is our upper room. This is our Pentecost, because we encounter the presence of the living God here in our celebrations. And so this is an encounter in which God gives himself to us. Christ gives himself to us. The Spirit gives himself to us and invites us to respond in kind, to give something of ourselves over to this encounter. Why should we believe this? Because this is actually the foundation of our faith. The fact that God wants to be in relationship with us. God wants to have a relationship with you. For as much as any of us may think that we are trying to pursue a relationship with God, seeking God's presence in our own lives, God is seeking us even more so. Because it is God who desires to have a relationship with us. God wants to be in intimate, loving relationship with us. Remember in John's Gospel, Jesus said, The Father and I will come and reveal ourselves to you. Why? Because we love you. God wants to be in relationship with us. God is holy and holy other. None of us is going to become God. God is always transcendent. God is always beyond us. And yet, this God who is beyond us chooses to be with us. And so God continues to communicate with and be in touch with human beings. Every time we gather together, especially for the celebration of the Eucharist, we're reminded of this. Because in our celebration, God speaks to our lives. God touches our hearts. God comes to us in a variety of ways, revealing God's presence to our lives.
And so God chooses to make himself known in ways that respect our capacity to receive. God chooses to make himself known. And the church says that there are several ways that God chooses to do this, foundational ways. Certainly, God's self-revelation to us comes through sacred scripture. For those of you who are lectors, when you get up to proclaim God's word, you are not just reading nice stories to the liturgical assembly. You are not just proclaiming the poetry of the Psalms. You are not just proclaiming moral exhortations from the New Testament. The words you proclaim are God's word. And God is present in that word. God is revealing God's self to us in sacred scripture. And not only does God reveal God's self to us in the scriptures, but God also reveals himself to us in tradition. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church in Article 83 says, liturgy, which incorporates sacred scripture, is a part of the living tradition of the church as a vehicle and expression of our faith. So one of the fundamental liturgical principles that comes to us from the 5th century, and that I still teach my students in the seminary today, is lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer grounds the law of belief. What does this mean? It means that when we come to the celebration of the church's liturgy, especially the Eucharist, we're not just proclaiming what we believe, our very beliefs are being shaped by the way that we pray. Our very lives are being shaped by the way that we pray. Do you remember this past go uh, Sunday's Gospel? You know, where Jesus is being tested by the religious leaders of his faith community once again. And they're like, can we pay the temple tax? Can we pay the tax to Caesar or not? And it was all a farce because they were simply trying to trap him. And what does Jesus say? Looks at the coin. Whose face is this? Whose inscription is this? Then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And what is God's? Everything everything and we should walk out of our celebration of the eucharist having heard that word with the realization that everything that we are belongs to god so what are we going to do about it how are we going to choose to live only for ourselves or for God and for one another. Lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer grounds the law of belief. The liturgy shapes our lives. And I think we can add sort of a complementary um, to, to these basic foundational ways in which God reveals himself to us, which I would call spiritual indwelling, as we grow in our relationship with God, we are to come to the realization that God, out of God's own love for us, has chosen to join his life to ours. When you pray, where do you pray? Notice I didn't ask you to whom do you pray. I asked you to where do you pray. When you think about it, you're sitting in your favorite easy chair at home, praying the rosary, reading the scriptures, doing devotional prayers, spending time meditating. To where do you direct your prayers? Or when you come into church and you sit down in your favorite pew in your favorite spot, to where do you direct your prayers? So oftentimes, I think when we pray, we pray to a God who's out there someplace. We sit in our favorite easy chair and we direct our prayers up to the heavens as if God is way out at the far reaches of the universe. Or when we come into church, we direct our prayers to the presence of Christ in the tabernacle. 
or to an image of the Lord, risen or crucified, or to an image of, of Mary or one of the saints. And yet, all of the great saints and mystics of our church tell us if you really want to grow in your relationship with God, you need to go inside. You need to seek God in the depths of your own heart. God is nearer to us than every breath we take. God is nearer to us than every beating of our hearts. Why is that? Because at our baptism, God chose to come to dwell in us. We were freed from original sin because God filled us with God's life. God made an irrevocable choice for us. And the Father, Son, and Spirit chose to unite their life to our lives. God dwells in you. And if you find that hard to believe, what were you taught when you were confirmed? You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? You are the dwelling place of God. God dwells in you. And think about what we do at Eucharist, Sunday after Sunday, day after day. We consume the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Lord Jesus. We feast upon the divine life. And our very act of eating and drinking not only reminds us that God dwells in us, but it also renews the presence of the divine in our lives. Again, this is why some of the great saints of our tradition had no problem saying that we are living tabernacles because God dwells in us by God's choice. And we need to pay attention to the indwelling presence of God. And so God chooses to make himself known to us and invites from us a response. I mean, if I, if I become convinced that God dwells in me, then that also means I have to be convinced that God dwells in you. So how am I going to treat you? I should reverence you because of the indwelling presence of the Father, Son, and Spirit. None of us is merely human because we share in the divine life. And so it calls for a response from us in faith, in hope, and in love. God's self-communication, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, is not so compelling that a person could not reject the invitation. So you can walk out of here tonight and think to yourself, that whole stuff about the indwelling presence of God, God dwelling in me, that's crazy talk. It's the teaching of the church. But we can put up our resistance and say, well, that has nothing to do with me because I know my weaknesses. I know my faults and failings. I know the mistakes I've made in the past. I know my experience of sin. I'm not that great of a prayer. Why would God want to have a deep and intimate and personal relationship with me? He already does. It's just that so oftentimes we're not responding to it. Because God already desires that for us. So it's possible for us to put God off. In fact, the Catechism says in 1131, where it defines what a sacrament is, the sacraments bear fruit in those who receive them with the required dispositions. Grace is not magic. It's not automatic. We have to want what God desires to give. I tell my students at the seminary, you can go to Mass a hundred times a day, receive communion a hundred times a day, and not grow one iota in holiness. 
because it's not automatic. You have to want the grace that the Eucharist gives. You have to want to be transformed. You have to want to live as Christ, to become what we receive. You've got to want it. We have to have a disposition for what it is that God is offering to us. And so all of the popes of the modern age have told us that it is possible for us to receive the sacraments in vain. To go through the motions, but not to grow in grace. Because we have to want what God gives. And part of that wanting is also a desire to respond, to let the grace of God change us in some way. How does God do this? Well, in sacramental theology, there's a thing that we call the sacramental principle. And basically, this is about mediation. That God's presence and will are known to human beings through concrete reality. God makes himself known to us. God reveals God's will to us through persons, events, and the things associated with them. Notice that the Catechism of the Catholic Church in Article 1087 says, persons are sacramental signs of Christ. We are a part of, re of revealing the presence of Christ to the world. We ourselves become sacraments. We don't just receive the sacraments, we become the sacramental presence of Christ. God chooses to work through us. If you're an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion and somebody comes up to you to receive communion, one of the things I always tell folks in the diocesan formation sessions is when you hold up the host and you say the body of Christ, look the person in the eye. Don't be staring at the host. Look the person in the eye when you say that. Why? Because you may be the only person who has paid any amount of attention to this individual throughout this entire week. This is an encounter, a sacramental encounter in which Christ is revealing himself. If you're an usher standing at the doors of the church welcoming people with a smile and a polite greeting, folks then know that they belong here. You are being Christ to them. When you as a lector prayerfully pro prepare to proclaim God's word by having reflected upon the word, prayed with it, practiced it, so that it doesn't seem like the first time that you're proclaiming it is when you got out to the ambo for, you know, on Sunday morning. You are being Christ for that community. And people will know that you have already prayerfully prepared. Okay. So God uses us, and God uses the events of our lives in order to reveal God's self to us. And what God is revealing is not information about God. God is revealing God's very self to us. This is a personal encounter between God and the community of faith, between God and each member of the community. Our liturgy isn't about learning something, in a sense. It's not about having some kind of intellectual insight. It's about engaging in a relationship that can change the whole course of our lives. So we're encountering the very presence of God. And so the church says that the invisible God uses perceptible reality to be with us and to touch our lives in love, to transform us, to inspire us to further action, to move us towards our ultimate goal. 
which is to live life in union with God. Our ultimate go goal is to love God with all that we are and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Isn't that what Jesus told us? Those are the most important commandments. And the liturgy of the church and what we do in our individual ministries for the sake of the community is all about moving us towards that goal. And so God uses us, our ministry, in order to make God's presence known. In all of this, we human beings do not cease to be human beings because we are dealing with the divine and human interaction. We are a sacramental church. This is the thing that really kind of marks us uniquely as Roman Catholics, is that not just that we celebrate the sacraments, but, with, but we believe in the sacramental principle, that God uses concrete stuff, including us, in order to make God's presence known. We are called to be instruments of the presence of the divine, to share the divine life through our very lives. We believe that we can see, that we can recognize, that we can discern the presence and activity of God in our lives. Even as God chooses to use us, This doesn't mean that what we are doing is somehow a substitute for God or simply a reminder of God's presence. That's not what our celebrations of the liturgy are. They're not just simply a reminder to us that God is present in our lives. No, this is a living encounter with the presence of God in our midst. Our liturgies are actually a channel of God's presence a catalyst by which we encounter the presence of the living God. Let me tell you a little story. So uh, one of the parishes in our diocese, before I was a bishop, I I've been teaching at the seminary for the past 24 years, and during that time there's been a number of different parishes in the diocese where I've helped out on the weekends. In one of the parishes, I've been going there for about seven years, and had gotten to know a lot of the families in the parish, and one day I was there for Sunday Mass. We celebrated Sunday Mass, and after Sunday Mass was finished, I was standing in the gathering area greeting people, and a mother comes up to me dragging her two teenage sons with her. And I knew the boys because they had, they had served Mass for me before. And just the look on their faces was like, oh, I can't believe Mom is doing this, you know? So she's dragging her two teenage sons behind her, and she comes up to me and she says, Father Mike... I did not want to hear that this morning. I'm like, you didn't want to hear what? And she said, let me tell you what kind of a morning I have had. This morning I went into the boys' room and said to them, boys, it's time to get up. You know, get up, get yourselves dressed, get some breakfast, we got to get ready to go to church. No response. I come back ten minutes later, they're still in bed. I'm like, boys! It's time to get up. You got to get up, get dressed, get some breakfast. We gotta, we're going to be late for church. Get moving. And all I hear is this moaning coming from underneath their sheets. Come back ten minutes later. They have not moved. I am like, boys, we are going to be late for church. Get up. And then I go to my husband and I say to him, will you help me get these boys up? And as I'm talking to him, I'm hearing them saying, we don't want to go to church this morning. And then my husband says, I don't want to go to church this morning either. I am like, we are going to church. We are a family. Get yourselves up and get dressed. We are going to church. We got here late. It was so full this morning, we had to walk up the center aisle and go into the front pew with everybody looking at us. I made them sit at one end of the pew, I sat at the other end of the pew. And then you got up and read the gospel. No, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. 
and you started talking about forgiveness. I did not want to hear about forgiveness this morning. By the time we got to the sign of peace, I knew what I had to do. I went to the other end of the pew. I hugged my husband and my two boys, and I exchanged the sign of peace with them and told them how important it is for me that we come to Mass as a family. Who changed? She did. She did. That's the transforming power of God's grace working through the liturgy. The liturgy is an encounter with the presence of the living God. And that encounter can change us. So let me ask you this. How have you experienced others as a sacrament of God's presence? Bringing you life? Bringing you love? Bringing you compassion, mercy, forgiveness, understanding? Who have been the people in your lives that have been a sacrament of God's presence for you? And how have you experienced yourself as a sacrament of God's presence for others? Do you even see yourself as a sacrament of God's presence? Do you recognize that in fulfilling your ministry in your community, you are a sacrament of the presence of God for those whom you serve? Consider those questions for just a moment. Now I put on this slide the word break because I thought by now they're going to be sitting on hard pews. They're at least going to want to stand. I didn't know your pews were padded. <laughs> so I still have about a half an hour here, okay, just so you know. But it might be a good idea if we at least stood, okay, just for a moment, just to kind of get the blood flowing. How are we doing so far? Are we doing all right? Okay. Yeah, just to get the blood flowing a little bit. Maybe not quite a half an hour. Okay, why don't we be seated again, all right? <clears throat> so let's go back to this theme. Christ giving Christ to Christ. What do I mean by this? Christ the minister giving Christ the sign to Christ our brother or sister. Christ the minister. You, extraordinary minister of Holy Communion, server, reader, choir member, cantor, music member, usher, sacristan, art and environment people, deacon, presider. Each and every one of us in some way is called to be Christ for our brothers and sisters in our ministry. And even as a member of the liturgical assembly, we are called to be Christ to the community that has gathered. Christ the sign, 
What is it that we give through our ministry? Extraordinary Minister Holy Communion, give the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Lord Jesus to those who come to receive the Eucharist. Our altar servers assist at the table of the Lord, at the altar of the Lord, giving of their service to the community of faith so that the liturgy can be celebrated well. Our lectors proclaim God's word so that we can encounter the presence of God in that word proclaimed. Our music ministers lead us in prayer, in song. Singing is not just a nice thing to add on to the liturgy. It is our prayer. St. Augustine said those who sing, and he actually said well, those who sing <laughs> pray twice. Right? So each and every one of us through our ministry is giving something of Christ to those around us. And who are we giving Christ to? The ones who, to whom we are ministering. Because if we truly believe that the presence of God dwells in each and every one of us, that Christ has joined his life to each and every one of us, then we are ministering to Christ in each and every one of us. Christ giving Christ to Christ. Do we see Christ working through us to give him to himself in our brothers and sisters. St. John of the Cross, one of the great doctors of the church, great teachers of prayer, 16th century Spanish Carmelite mystic, says that as we act in Christ, we are becoming Christ by participation. By sharing in his life, we extend his life into the world. We are becoming Christ by participation. At the Second Vatican Council, the bishops gathered a council. Their very first document that they issued was Sacrosanta Concilium, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. In Article 14, probably one of the most frequently quoted articles from Sacrosanta Concilium, the bishops wrote, The Church earnestly desires that all the faithful be led to that full conscious and active participation in the liturgical celebrations called for by the very nature of the liturgy. Such participation is their right and duty by reason of their baptism. You have a right to participate in the liturgy of the church. But you also have a duty to participate in the liturgy of the church. And this is not just about singing more or praying more or paying attention more. Participation is about entering into the encounter, seeking the presence of God being revealed to us in the celebration of the church's liturgy allowing the presence of God to continue to transform our lives. This is not a new teaching. This has been a teaching of the church for centuries, that we are called to participate, to engage in this encounter, to be ministers of the encounter, and also to be recipients of the encounter with God. What do we mean by participation? According to Sacrosanta Concilium, participation is both internal and external. The external participation we get. It includes verbal participation, ritual actions, gestures, bodily attitudes, silence. Verbal participation, singing, praying, responding. Ritual actions, processing, Striking our breasts during the confidior, bowing before the reception of Holy Communion. Gestures, the Lord be with you. The Oran's position, maybe when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Bodily attitudes, standing. We stand at the gospel, a sign of respect to receive Christ. Kneeling, a sign of penance and adoration. Sitting upright, listening attentively. All of these things, the external stuff we get. 
I think it's the internal participation that we don't oftentimes understand. So participation is often expressed outwardly, and yet the church teaches us it is primarily a habit of interior presence and assent. Seeking, listening, hopeful expectation, receptivity, the desire to encounter the presence of God and to be transformed by that encounter. This is primarily an attitude of offering, an offering of ourselves, and an openness to receiving what it is that God desires to give. Sacrosanctum Concilium, Article 14, goes on to say, in the reform and promotion of the liturgy, this full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered before all else. If any of you are involved in preparing liturgies, one of the first questions we always have to ask ourselves is, how do we help people to be able to enter into the liturgy prayerfully, attentively? How do we help them participate? If we're doing something out of the ordinary, how do we help people to know what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it? Because this is the first thing that we need to be concerned about, the council said. How do we help people to enter into that encounter? And why is that? Because participation is not an end in itself. It is a means to an end. For it is the primary and indispensable source from which the faithful are to derive the true Christian spirit. It's through our participation that we encounter the presence of God so that we can grow in holiness, the true Christian spirit, so that we can embody the gospel message, so that we can be the bearers of God's presence to the world. And therefore, pastors must zealously strive in all their pastoral work to achieve such participation. We've been given this responsibility. How do we achieve this participation? Well, we begin by remembering that the liturgy, and especially our celebration of the Eucharist, it's not about us. It's not about me coming to church expecting to be entertained. It's not about us having the kind of liturgy that we like because of its style or the type of hymns that are chosen or how long it lasts. It's not about us getting what we want from God out of prayer. It's not about us avoiding sin by absenting ourselves from God in the community on Sundays. It's not about us simply fulfilling an obligation. Liturgy is not about you and me. The liturgy is first and foremost about God and what God is doing in our midst about God's action, what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, what God is doing for us in the here and now, how God is revealing his grace, his salvation, his mercy, his love to us. It's about what God is promising us now for the future. It's about God sharing God's own life with us, by which we are sanctified and made holy, by which we are transformed, by which we are able to engage in the process of conversion, becoming saints, because we're all called to become saints. That's our destiny. Everyone in heaven is a saint, declared or undeclared by the church, canonized or uncanonized by the church. Everyone in heaven is a saint. That's our destiny. That's what we hope for. And that begins in the here and now. And it's about what God does in order to bring that about in our lives and our willingness to cooperate with God's grace. And so the liturgy, especially the Eucharist, it's about encounter. It's about encountering the presence of God. Being touched by God's presence is to experience ourselves being called and sent, being forgiven and healed being nourished and strengthened, being formed and informed, 
being affirmed and challenged. And how does that encounter happen? In very concrete ways. Through the presider and all the ministers. Through the community gathered together in prayer and song. Through the word that's proclaimed and the sacraments that are celebrated. And all of these encounters lead to relationship. A relationship that we are to have with God and with one another. This is so significant that in his very first encyclical letter, promulgated on Christmas Day in 2005, Pope Benedict wrote this in the very first paragraph. Being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. How has Jesus changed your life? That's what the Pope is asking us to consider. How has our encounter with God changed us? In some way made us different. I can't tell you how many times I've done the Extraordinary Ministry of Holy Communion training for the diocese and towards the end of the formation session talked about not just distributing communion at Sunday Mass in the community, the parish where folks are coming from, but also saying we need to be willing to take this to the homebound, to bring the Eucharist to those who are in hospitals and nursing homes, those who cannot join us at the Sunday celebration of Eucharist. And I've had people come up to me afterwards saying, oh, Father, you know, I don't think I can do that. You know, that, that makes me very nervous. I don't think I can do that. And I've oftentimes said to people, try it. Because I know what's going to happen. You're going to get more out of it than you give. Your life is going to be changed by going to God's sick and God's poor, God's lonely, God's elderly. That encounter with Christ in others changes us. And so, because God comes to encounter us, we need to respond. And we respond by giving thanks and praise. The very word Eucharist, Eucharistia in the, in the Greek, literally means thanksgiving. Every celebration of the Mass, it is one big thank you to God for what God has done for us in Christ Jesus and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is God's action, where God is giving himself to us, where Christ is filling us with his own presence, renewing us in the power of the Spirit. When you receive the Eucharist, you are not just receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Lord Jesus. You're receiving the whole of God's life. So remember what Jesus said in the Gospels. When the disciples, he's talking to them about the Father, and one of the disciples is like, well, show us the Father. That'll be enough. And Jesus says, I've been with you all this time and you still don't get it? To see me is to see the Father. The Father and I are one. The words that I speak, they're not my words. They're the Father's words. The works I do, they're not my works. They're the Father's works. The Father and I will give you the Spirit as another advocate. Jesus never does anything apart from the Father and the Spirit. And so to receive the Eucharist is to receive not just Christ, but the whole of God's life. This God, whom not even the whole of the universe can contain, chooses to give the whole of himself to us and to constantly renew us in the whole of his life. And for that we give thanks and praise. And our relationship grows from that. The liturgy of the church is a privileged place of encounter by God's choice. You know, I can sit in my favorite easy chair in my suite at the seminary and spend time in prayer, and at the end of my prayer time think to myself, well, did God hear? Did anything happen? 
You know, was this worthwhile? I'm not sure if this was an encounter or not. I don't have to worry about that at the celebration of the liturgy. Because every time we celebrate the liturgy, especially the Eucharist, by God's choice, God reveals himself to us. It is always an encounter with the presence of the divine. And so every liturgy, every sacramental celebration is an encounter with the living God. And so this is one of my principles that my students at the seminary have heard ad nauseum. We should walk out different from the way we walk in because of this encounter. We should walk out different from the way we walk in may not be a St. Paul on the road to Damascus kind of a difference, but something different. Maybe it's just becoming a little bit more aware of God's love for us, or God's mercy, or understanding. Maybe we encounter the presence of God in somebody who reached out to us and asked us how we were doing as we were here on su Sunday Mass. And maybe said to us, I'll pray for you. And just to know that there's somebody who's praying for us can make a big difference. We should walk out different from the way that we have walked in. So having said that, when it comes to participating in the celebration of the church's liturgy, especially the Eucharist, when it comes to actively engaging in the ministries to which we have been called. If the liturgy and our ministries are going to make a difference in our lives, we need to walk into the celebration with the conviction that I am going to encounter the presence of the living God. That God is going to, in some way, speak to my life, touch my heart, bring healing, hope, Grace, love, mercy, challenge. That God in some way is going to touch my life and make a difference. We need to walk in with that expectation. And to look for it, to seek it, to desire it, to want it. Because in fact, again, in the Second Vatican Council, Sacrosanta Concilium, we are told that Christ is really present in the presider. And obviously in the other ministers who are serving at the liturgy. Christ is really present in the word that is proclaimed. Christ is really present in the people gathered together in prayer and song. And Christ is really present in the sacraments, and uniquely so in the Eucharist. Usually when we hear that phrase, real presence, we automatically think of the Eucharist and the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. But the church teaches that Christ is really present, working through with and in the ministers of the church, really present in the word that is proclaimed, really present in the people who are gathered, really present in the sacraments. Pope St. Paul VI, in his document on the Eucharist, Mysterium Fidei, affirmed this teaching of the Second Vatican Council said, yes, Christ is really present in all of these ways. In the Eucharist, it is a presence par excellence, he said. A unique presence. But that doesn't mean that Christ is any less present in all of these other ways. Because the liturgy is always about encounter and growing in relationship. So with that in mind, what can we do to prepare ourselves for the celebration of Eucharist. I'm coming to the end. What can we do to prepare ourselves for the celebration of the Eucharist and our own ministry? First of all, with regard to the living word of God, we should be reading and praying the scripture readings before going to Mass on Sunday. Every pope of the 20th and 21st century has told us this. Don't let the scripture readings that you're hearing at Sunday Mass have those being the first time you've heard them. We should read the scripture readings before going to Mass and praying with them so that we can be even more attentive as they're being proclaimed. 
and then listen to the proclamation of the word. What do you hear? Is there a word, an idea, an image that stands out for you that could very well be God's word to you for that day, that week? Listen, what are you hearing? Listen to the homily. How does it apply to your life? How will you live the good news? And then after Mass, don't be afraid to ask family and friends, what did you hear? What did you experience? I come from a family of seven boys. I'm the second oldest of seven. When we were growing up as kids, on Sunday morning we would gather in the family station wagon, drive off to our parish church, drive home after church, and on the ride home, mom and dad always asked us, boys, what did father say in his homily today? We knew it was the test to see if we were paying attention. What my parents didn't know is that they were doing mystagogy with us. What did you hear? And interestingly enough, so oftentimes each and every one of us heard something different. We heard what we needed to hear for that day, that week. Don't be afraid to do mystagogy, at least with yourself. What did I hear? How did God speak to me? What is God asking of me in terms of living out this word? Live your life as an offering. You know, at Sunday Eucharist, we usually have an offertory procession. The bread and wine are brought forward along with the collection usually by members of the community. Okay? We don't do that simply to get the stuff from the back of the church to the front of the church. The people who are bringing the gifts forward, they represent all of us. And our desire to, to offer ourselves to God. It is not just bread and wine that is placed upon the table. We are placing ourselves on the altar to be offered to God as a living sacrifice of praise. So see yourself placed upon the altar with the desire to be transformed. It's not just bread and wine that gets consecrated at the Eucharist. It's also us. In every Eucharistic prayer, there are two invocations of the Holy Spirit. The first one we're very familiar with. The priest presider puts his hands out over the gifts and invokes the presence of the Spirit to transform them from bread and wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Lord Jesus. In the second half of every Eucharistic prayer, after the mystery of faith, there is always another invocation of the Holy Spirit in which we ask the Spirit to change us, to consecrate us, to make us holy, to help us to live as the body of Christ. So we need to place ourselves upon the altar. This is why, as a part of the offertory, the presider then turns to the community and says, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours, what you have placed upon the altar to be consecrated and made holy, may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. What of your life have you placed upon the altar? your hopes, your dreams, your fears, your doubts, your vices, your virtues, your joys, your sorrows, even your faults and failings, that God can transform us in ways that we cannot transform ourselves. And then pray the great prayer. The high point of the celebration of the Eucharist is the praying of the Eucharistic prayer. I think for many of our folks, it becomes intermission between the homily and communion time. Well, that's Father up there doing his thing. And I can start thinking about all the stuff that I need to do yet today. No. This is the prayer of the church. The priest may be voicing it for all of us, but the church's hope and expectation is that we are all praying as he is voicing our prayer to the Father through Christ in the power of the Spirit. And so it begins, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Become a part of this prayer. We lift them up to the Lord.
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It's not about us. It's about us giving thanks and praise to God. And so we're going to lift up our hearts to do that. We are going to be actively engaged in this prayer. Offering to God the whole of ourselves, even as the priest at the, offer, at the altar offers bread and wine and our own sacrifices that we have placed there. We are to be caught up into Christ's prayer. Listen as the prayer is being prayed. And pray yourself, you know, silently, in your own heart. In Eucharistic Prayer 3, one of my favorite lines is where we say to the Father through Christ, may he, Christ, make us an everlasting gift to you. To think that Christ would make me a gift that he would want to offer to his Father. Listen to what we're praying. This prayer, these themes, these images, it can change our lives. Because here's Christ offering you and me as a gift to the Father. Not just offering himself, but offering us as members of his body. And then at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, we all join together in the great Amen. You know, that's our way of saying, yes, everything we've just prayed here, I believe, I want, I desire, I hope, I dream. Yes, this is, this is it. This is what I want to be a part of. You know, don't let these familiar texts of the liturgy become an excuse to kind of zone out at this point in time. This prayer is too important. And then be mindful of the indwelling presence of this God who has done so much for us. Take and eat. Take and drink. St. Thomas Aquinas, in his writings, asked the question, why did Christ give us the gift of the Eucharist? And he says there's three primary reasons why Christ gave us this gift on the night before he died. First of all, so that he could be with us sacramentally. His presence abides. His presence abides in the Eucharist. So that he could join us to his ongoing saving activity. So that we could participate in his sacrifice and know the redeeming grace that comes from it. And then the one that most people don't even realize, because those first two, I think we kind of get. But the third reason Aquinas says is so that we can grow community so that we can grow in friendship with one another. Aquinas even goes so far as to say the Eucharist should help us to develop an affection for one another. An affection for one another. When you go to Mass this coming Sunday, look around. All these people who are so different different walks of life, different stories, different faith journeys. They are all people that God is calling you to love. Some of them you may have a very difficult time doing that with. But what helps us? The Eucharist. It helps us to grow in love, to have an affection for those who are a part of the community of faith. Pay attention to the life that is living within you. Remember you're a living tabernacle. St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, one of my favorite saints, just a few months before she died, she wrote a poem. She was the sacristan at her Carmelite community's monastery in Lisieux, France, and she wrote a poem about all the stuff we use in the liturgy. The altar, the ambo, the tabernacle, the sanctuary lamp, the vessels, the li altar linens. So she wrote this poem reflecting upon all the stuff we use in the liturgy. And when it comes to the monstrance, she's, and you know what the monstrance is, in which we have the Eucharist exposed for adoration, 
When it comes to the monstrance, she says, I am a living monstrance. I am a living monstrance. What does that mean? Others can look at me and see Christ. We are all called to be living monstrances. And God makes that happen. Pay attention to the life that's living within you. And then, at the end, we are dismissed. So, the Latin word misa is the word that is the foundation for the word mass, dismissal, and mission. We celebrate the mass in order to be dismissed so that we can live the mission. I was once teaching a PSR class of fifth graders and asked them, what's the most important part of the Mass? Immediately, one little girl put up her hand, called on her, and she said, the dismissal. And I said, you're right. Because we celebrate in order to be dismissed and to live the mission. If it just stays here, then the Mass is empty. Our lives are to be transformed so that we can then go out and be Christ for one another. So we need to choose to make a difference. We need to witness. How did you encounter the presence of the living God in today's celebration of the Mass? A mystagogical question. Something to reflect upon. To live the mission. And then finally, I know you thought it would never come. Just some reflection questions. What are you taking away with you? What did you hear tonight that you would like to affirm? What did you hear tonight that you found challenging? What do you need to reflect upon further? I know that I've thrown a lot at you tonight. Hopefully there's a kernel of something you're going to take home with you. Hold on to that kernel, whatever it is. Pray with it, reflect upon it, let God speak to you through it. And in doing so, trust that your life, your ministry, and your experience of celebrating the liturgy of the church will be transformed. Thank you for your kind attention this evening. Father Kevin, anything? presented by you, so so I just thank you very much. Absolutely. I'm glad uh, all of you came tonight, uh, especially Resurrection Pair. Who's from Resurrection? A lot of people. Look at this. Wow.
How about if we stand in prayer and bring our evening to an end? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Ever-present and faithful God, we give you thanks and praise for having brought us together this evening. We thank you for the wonder of your life united to our lives, for the saving presence of Christ in our midst, and the outpouring of your Holy Spirit into our hearts. We ask you to continue to guide us on our faith journey, and especially to lead us ever deeper into the transforming power and mystery of the Eucharist, the great gift of your Son to us, and as a sign of our own desire to continue to surrender our lives into your hands, together we offer to you the prayer that Jesus himself has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Lord be with you. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. comes together. Oh my gosh. Nice.